Paul, like, writes stuff and knows computers pretty good. Paul Ford. Hi. Am I on? Am I good? I'm going to uh, just talk about myself a little bit. I'm going to talk about uh, five websites that I've built over the last 18 years. And the title of this talk is Building Your Personal Platform. <laughs> that actually is the title of this talk. It is actually an accurate title. I am incredibly sorry. <laughs> and the first website, the first website I ever really built was this thing called ftrain.com. What you would, thank you. <laughs> Doesn't usually get that reaction. It's a nice crowd. <laughs> um, this site, it's what you would now call in a less civilized age a blog, but it was, a, it was there before blogging, and it was me just writing every day and being 22. It's called F-Train because the train used to go by outside my window, and I had no money. It was the F-Line of uh, the, the, it was the F Brooklyn, the, the Brooklyn subway, and I would just watch it go back and forth and wonder what was going to happen with my life. And I wrote about that through my 20s. And... That's that. From 1997 to today, it's been hanging out, and it's a weird thing because it's this artifact of, of a guy who isn't around anymore. Um, I haven't updated it in over a year, and it, it's kind of just hanging out. And so it taught me an enormous amount. I learned so much from doing this. I learned early days in the, in the late 90s that internet people are kind of crazy, and they'll stalk you, and that kind of the fundamental deal of doing stuff online is you give something away for free, and a lot of people scream at you. And <laughs> Which is, a, but you know, it's an actually an okay deal because some don't and you meet people. I, you know, I used to go, Gina Trapani and I used to walk around Prospect Park in Brooklyn 10, 15 years ago and here we are again and it's nice, it's sweet to have this connective tissue through my life. But the fact is, it remains that it's over and I don't know what to do with it. So I'm trying to figure that out. So that's F-Train. And the lesson of F-Train is that websites kind of never end. They hang out. And I'm trying to figure that out. Now, I'm talking about five websites. Two of them are public. Three of them are secret. So the second one, one day, I got, a, I got an email saying, hey, I like F-Train. Would you ever like to make a website for Harper's Magazine? Now, if you don't know Harper's, that's fine. Only a very, very small number of people do. Um, <laughs> but... It's very highfalutin. It's a very serious general interest literary magazine. It's been around since 1850. And at that point, kind of sitting in my little room, feeling weird about my life, I was like, hell yeah. So I went there, and the, the thing that they didn't tell me is that the publisher hated the internet. And when I say, <laughs> and when I say that, I don't mean, like, this is the official Harper sweatshirt. This is, for, or uh, uh, softball shirt. This is from about two months ago. They had these made. That's the, that's the, can everyone see that? It just says Harper's Magazine. And on the back of it, it says that. Okay? That's a real thing. That's, that was, that was the job I got as the web guy. So, I thought, I mean, I thought I was just like, I thought this was all going to be gravy. And they're literally, they were like, ooh. It's also, honestly, it was a very like, like my, my second day, I went in for a meeting, and, or, or there was an editorial meeting, and it was about some really, really, really grisly story. I can't even remember what. And I turned to the, uh, this editor, and I went, well, you, you got to have hope. And he went, hmm, uh, that's not us guy. <laughs> and uh, that was a serious thing. He actually, like, the official policy of the magazine was no hope. So I was there for five years, <laughs> no hope. Uh, and, and very little internet. And so I had to figure out what to do with very little, 
very few resources. The flip side is I learned some wonderful things. Like that same editor who said there was no hope, one day I was asking him for advice on editing, and he said the smartest thing that anyone has ever said to me about editing or writing, which is just keep like with like. That was a wonderful rule. Because like, and another guy uh, took me aside and he's like, you gotta understand, a sentence is like an arrow. It's like firing an arrow. You, you, you sit there, you take aim, you fire the arrow, you hope it hits the target, and then you do it again. And thinking thoughts like that for five years was wonderful. Like, sentences are individual units of meaning, and you look for patterns, and you keep like with like, and you kind of, they congeal into, into articles that people want to read. That, that was a good thing to learn. So, since I couldn't do anything with the magazine because they didn't want to give anything away because fuck the internet, I had to create an archive. I like literally, I was like, well, it's been around since 1850. We can do something with that. So, in that time, you can see I didn't have any money for design. But I did, if you can see at the top there, there all these years, 1850, 1860, and so on and so forth. That's all just me scanning and coding and scaling images. And so, 250,000 images, 18 months of really hard work, et cetera. At the same time, there was all this other content floating around, like Harper's did a thing called the Harper's Index. Very little index statistics, like the length and feet of a wooden penis carried through the streets of Kamaka, Japan, during a spring fertility ceremony. And so I started, is 8.3. So I started adding tags to those pieces, like I would link penis to, to sex, and that would automatically create these timelines where each little item became an element in the timeline. It was sort of like I was hashtagging history way before anyone used hashtags, and again, a, a better era. And, um, and so I was organizing all these crazy semantic relationships and so on and so forth, and they went and they redesigned the site, uh, and all of that went away, but it stuck with me. I thought about that a lot. Now, now we're into the secret sites. This one, Oli.com. It stands for One Huge Lesson in Humility. I'm going to get very, very serious for one second, but I think it's, it's okay to do that. Uh, when I was at the end of that time at Harper's, around 2010, I had a pretty, what in retrospect was a very serious depressive episode. And the way that I knew it is I was waiting for the train, and I went, boy, it'd be good to be in front of that. And that was the, that was, my brain just went, whoa, no. And I'd been very sad, and I, I, I really... Uh, one of the issues in my life, it's kind of not a secret, is that I have a really messed up compulsive relationship with food and with eating. It's not something I hide or can hide, and some years I'm doing great and some years I'm not. This is kind of a bad year right now. But I went home uh, after that incident, and I told my wife about it, which was in retrospect the right thing to do. And uh, I was going to go see a therapist and I put it off and put it off, but what I did instead was go ahead and build a website. <laughs> Of course. So, one huge lesson in humility is essentially a calorie tracker. That's all it was. And I know people may have strong opinions about the calorie model and, and about, and just like, sometimes when you're actually trying to lose weight and you're trying to research the right ways to do it, you feel like your body is a battlefield because everybody is bananas about what's the right way to do it. But it's my body. And, uh, and so I started to write, and I, I made it a blogging tool. So I had to put in a picture, and I had to write, and I had to then track my calories. And it made, a little, it made a little chart. It would add them up at the end of the day, and it would go red if I'd gone over, and it would stay black if I hadn't. And so I had these little daily sheets, and then it would sum things up over the course of the month. I could see my bad days and my good days, and I could see what was going on. And, and what that taught me from building, I lost 90 pounds on that. That was really good. I gained a number of them back. But at that, when I used this and I was serious about it and I was committed to it, I lost 90 pounds and I was very, doing very, very well. And then a block showed up with it and I'm still working through that block. Uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly where the wall is. And um, I'm still working on that. So there's two things to learn from there. One is that tremendous change is possible over time. And the other is that sometimes things just stop working, and it's not clear why. So those are my lessons from one huge lesson in humility. And uh, just, it's out. I don't actually talk about this thing too much, but uh, I'm also, I need to just like put the code up on GitHub or something. I'll, I'll do that soon. So nothing works forever. Another secret website. I finally went and saw that therapist, and we found out that there was a link between my tremendous, constant, ongoing, eternal anxiety and the compulsive relationship with food. Who knew? And, uh, and so one day, 
And then actually I did a, I did a thing, which is I went out and I'm, I was supposed to be writing a book. I'm still supposed to be writing this book, and I'm a little late on the book. The book is about the web and how the web changed culture. And uh, um, so, you know, I, I keep building websites about it instead of writing it. So I got so anxious about not writing the book and feeling that I was slipping on the, on the one huge lesson in humility that I made this site called Anxiety Box. Very simple. All you do is you put in your name and your email and your anxiety, and it sends you emails. And I made a little bot called Anxiety Box Bot, and it says things like, I don't agree with all the people who say that you are weak-kneed and monstrous. It's a very passive-aggressive little bastard of a bot, and it says all the horrible things that rot inside of my brain. And it turned out that having it send me mean emails three or four times a day was a wonderful way to manage my anxiety because it would externalize it. I'd get this email with a subject like, the reason no one notices your work is because you are dishonest and pitiful. <laughs> and, then, and it would say, I was thinking about what you said, that you were worried about losing weight. And what I concluded was this, when you meet successful people, they think of you as deservedly alone. Sincerely, your anxiety. And I would write back, and I would just write back, eat a dick! <laughs> eat a dick, I hate you! And that little screaming voice, right? Thank you, that little screaming voice. I was able to discipline it. And it was actually amazing to see that you could simulate the worst parts of yourself with a computer. It's everything's like, hey, use Fitbit and you're going to get in shape. But it's like, actually, my huge, horrible garbage shelf, I could put that into the computer and I could look at it and I could see it. And I could have this, like, a little space. And it turns out that, like, your worst qualities make great bots because they're actually just <laughs> shrieking little zombie bastards that say the same thing over and over and over and over again. So, oh, poem break. <laughs> Certain things would lock into my, uh, lock into my brain, and, and uh, this poem, it's, I would normally, it's, it's by Rumi, who is a, a 12th century Persian poet. He's very associated with the New Age, but I figure I'm in Portland, and it's cool. So this poem is called The Guest House. This being human is a guest house. Every morning is a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes in, an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows. It's the most internet poem. <laughs> Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. So I like that poem. <laughs> Somewhere, somewhere Rumi's laughing. And so, um, so I look back at these sites, and I thought to myself, what do they have in common? And they're all about change over time. They're all about doing things with time and, and using the web, and the fact that the web is kind of weirdly permanent for all that this medium gets criticized for its strange ephemerality. Everything sticks around forever. And I did the thing that, of course, you should never do, which is I sat there and I said, you know, I've got this book deal and I need to write about the web, and, but there's no great note-taking software. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and it's going to take me like a couple weeks and I'll just have the tool that I want. <laughs> um, so that did not actually happen that way. And what I am about to show you is... Uh, we're a year in. Uh, I'm actually now finally able to use it for writing. Um, it is called unscroll.com. And I'll just, sh uh, this is where I show the videos or maybe do a demo. No, I'm going to show a video. It's safer. It's safer. Um, okay. It's a timeline. It's a timeline of history. Uh, and you can do things with it. The, the events are imported from Wikipedia. Uh, it's, and let me hit, let me start the video, which is just me moving a mouse. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to search. I'm going to search for radio shows. 
Okay, here's some radio shows, 9,740 of them from archive.org, 1915 to 2007. What you can't see is that I'm scrolling up and down and zooming in and out of time. I'm zooming in, and what I'm looking for here, actually, the questions I want to answer are how did, like, what was my father listening to on the radio when he was a kid? What were the experiences he had? I want to understand that. I want to see it directly. That's been bugging me for years, and I can click, and I can hear the radio show, and I can come back, and so on and so forth. So that's the focus of this thing, to, to put notes and ideas, radio shows, eventually the calories that I tracked can go in here, all the stuff, all the ephemera of life. It's not one timeline, it's many, 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 many timelines, which I call scrolls. And there's one that I made, I want to tell you very quickly about my friend Leslie, who died in 2006. And I've been thinking about her a lot lately because she died around the age that I am now. She was a very, very early person on the web. She created zines, she created websites, uh, and she was very influential. She got, I don't think I would have the writing career I'd have if she hadn't shown confidence me, in me and, and pushed me hard early on. And so, but after she died, her family wanted her sites to basically disappear. And that was their right. And uh, her stuff kind of floats out there in archive.org and so on, but there's actually no place. As a friend of hers, I can't go back and find her work unless I, I figure out like a way to do that. And that's kind of one of the things that I'm trying to do with this. Um, she had a weblog called the Hoopla 500, and there it is. On the, those are all the entries from it, from archive.org. I've put them into the timeline. And I can also start to layer in stuff. I won't show this right now, but I can layer in stuff like what was going on in the world when she was writing. And then what I can do is I can add notes to those events. This is very simple. It's, very, it's a little nerdy, but I can add notes to the things that happen. And the notes get compiled. They get kind of turned into an essay. And so what happens is that here are my notes. And there are the, the web is kind of over on the left side of the screen, and my writing is on the right side. It's just a notebook interface, but I'm always connected. Everything I write is actually connected at the, at the technical level to things that happen, to events, to the signals that led to the writing. And I'm hoping over time that things sort of evolve out of this, that I can never lose track, that it, it is it's an aid to memory, a guide, a way to keep um, all, of, all of the things that I learn and find that I can sort of keep them closer together. And it, honestly, I've been using it. Uh, yeah, I am done. Um, I've been using it, and it does make it easier for me. I, I, I feel more suddenly confident, and there's more structure and more awareness. And it could just be because I'm the guy building it. Um, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's something other people won't want to use. And people have been asking me, what do you want to do with this? What's the goal? The goal is to work on it. I don't necessarily need, I mean, I've built it myself over the course of a year. I'm going to keep working on it. The goal is to work on it for 20 years. I've worked on the web for almost 20 years now, and I'd like to work on this problem, the relationship between time and ideas and prose and expression for the next 20 years. And so, thank you. And so, History and anxiety and dead friends and living friends and radio shows and my father and all of that, I want, I, I'm making a place where those can all go. And if someone else wants to use them, I, I hope they, they find it useful. And what I'm doing is specifically, I'm trying to make room for all of it, for the whole crowd of sorrows and to welcome and entertain them all uh, with this. And if you want to log in, let me know. And I'm going to go work on it for a couple of decades. <laughs> and I hope that I will see you soon. Thank you.